So let's talk function operators. So last chapter we learned about function factories and function factories are basically functions that create functions. And this chapter we're talking about function operators, which are really similar to function factories in that they're returning functions as the output, but a function operator is not just taking a static input as a function factory was, a function operator is taking one or more functions as the input as well. So as a first example, let's say we wanted to make a function that squares the results of a vector, and it also tells us what element in the vector it's working on, and we wanted to do this with permap. So it's pretty easy enough to write a function that would do this. We can write our little square function like this, and then we can make a function, a function called Taki. And Taki here is going to take in the input of, did, did I just drop? Uh, is everyone still there? Yeah, yeah you're here, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so weird, okay, sorry. The, the Zoom box just disappeared and I can't see anyone's screen. Um, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, participants. Oh no, what happened? Oh. Ah. Um, I don't know what just happened there. Um, okay, I'm gonna leave the chat up, sorry, because everyone's face disappeared, so I don't know if anyone's there. Um, oh, it's back, okay, oh, that, was, that was weird. Uh, so, sorry, okay. Uh, you can still see my screen? Yeah. yeah. Okay, right. So let's make a function called talkie. Um, this is going to spit out the value x here, and then it's going to run the function square and then it'll print the result like this using the blue package and we can run it using functionals as we did um, as we did uh, when we learned about functionals so we use per map we run it across s we do talkie and this prints out the value and then the square but let's say now we want a function that's going to speak the results for a cube so we could basically write a new function up, a new function for each one, and we would change here. We would change um, rather than square x, we'd write cube x. But instead, what we can do is we can write what's called a function operator, which will take in any function as an output. So this is this function operator here, which we're going to call chatty. It's going to take as an input function f. It's going to force it, so it's going to evaluate it immediately, so that we don't have this hanging promise and having problems as we discussed last week. And then it's going to return this function, which we're going to call talkative function, which takes in uh, any input x um, and these triple dots. It's going to evaluate function f on x, and it's also going to allow you to pass in any extra arguments with these triple dots here. And then it will say processing x, um, return results. And then we can make a function called square we can do a cube, we can make a function that will scream a string back at you, um, repeating it n times. And we can run again with a map, we can say chatty square. So we're putting into the input of chatty, we're putting the square function as its input. If we do map double, this will go for three, nine, two, four, one, one. Uh, we can do chatty cube, three, 27, two, eight, one, one. Um, and then we can, of course, also use the same function for screaming strings here. So now we're going to map on vowels, A, E, A, O. So this will go A, A, O, O, E, E. Um, and then, of course, we can add in the additional arguments to this function here as arguments here. So chatty N30. And we will have A, A. A E E E. So the reason we'd want to build a function operator, the kind of motivating example for it, rather than just using a function factory, is that it wraps more flexibly around functions, is the kind of concept behind it. So there are pre-built function operators, and chapter nine tried to 
convince us that we should stop using for loops for everything because they're too flexible. But one reason you might use a for loop is that if at least one iteration in a for loop fails, you still get to keep all the results up to that point. So let's try to sum a list of vectors. So we're gonna make a, a list called my broken list, which is gonna have these vectors, a numeric, ver numeric, a vector of strings, and then another numeric. And now let's try and sum it in a loop. So we're gonna loop through. First, we're gonna start by making something the length of our output, because you know we're, we're we're trying to make our loops faster here. Um, and then what we're going to do is for i seek along my broken list. We're going to sum my broken list dot i. We're going to wrap it in a try function because we expect maybe there's going to be an error, and then we can call as double. And we're going to get an error, but despite that, we're still going to have all of the outputs. So that's great, cool stuff. Um, if we try to do the same thing using a functional we will get the same error. However, we won't be able to get any of those iterations out as we were from the loop. So that's one reason why we might think, okay, let's stick with using the loops rather than trying to use the functionals. However, per comes with a function operator that allows us to do this safely. And it is called safely. So the way, oops. The way safely works is that you can use it as you did chatty, where you um, wrap it around or put it in. Um, so now we're going to wrap safe sum inside of safely, and we're going to map it as map my broken list per safely. And what safely returns is a list of lists. So for each iteration that it ran, it will give you the result and then whether or not there was an error. And if there wasn't an error, it just gives us a null. So result error. The book then talks about using transpose to make Safely's output be more helpful. Um, however, I don't know if we learned about transpose before. I had to Google it. So I'm gonna briefly describe what this function does if nobody had ever heard of it. Um, so what transpose does is it takes lists of lists and returns them into pairs of lists. So Let's make an annoying list um, using pers rerun function and see what it's gonna look like. So we have this list of lists, which is a list of five. Each of them has an X and an Y, an X and an Y, and an X and an Y. But this is kind of annoying to dig down into. Um, out of curiosity, does anyone remember a way we can use a functional to get all of the X's out of this nested list? I think you could just use the map functional and then um, the list name and then uh, x. Yeah. Woohoo! Um, sorry, I just put that in there because I was like, oh yeah, we know how to get things that are nested lists. Um, what transpose does is that it basically turns the list kind of inside out. So rather than having a list that looks like this, x, y, x, y, x, y, x, y, it will basically split it back into two lists of x, here are all my x's, y, here are all my y's. So that's how transpose works. Um, I thought that was a cool little function. I could imagine myself using it at some point. Right, so back to our broken list without using for loops. So we transpose, so we map, we use my broken list, we wrap sum in the function operator safely and we can transpose it and we can see that we have a functional list which is all of the results collected like this and all of the errors collected like this. We can then easily ask which of our elements led to these problems. So we can use map logical, um, get in the error list is null and then we can find out which of these was not okay and we result in the, oops, I'm not a double. So I mentioned this previously, but I thought this was so cool. And the reason I thought this was cool is that I have written code before that will, in a loop, take subsets of data and run linear models. And the reason I've done it this way is that sometimes the models don't converge. Um, 
And I was like, eh, you know, it's giving me errors when I try to do it with this map function. So I'm just going to write a big old loop. Um, but this basically shows you a way to get around that. So here's an example of something you could do. You write a fit. Um, your fit's going to be a GLM. You're predicting Y using X1, X2, and an interaction on a data frame. You then can define models as transpose, map, data sets. So you got your data sets. Um, you run safely fit model. And what this is going to do is it's going to fit all of your models except for the ones where it failed, um, which I thought was really cool. Then you can find which data sets fail to converge or which are OK. So I thought this was the most exciting thing in the world when I saw this. Um, other ways to be safe. So the other ones he talks about are possibly, which I think is another cool thing to do. He warns against using it because it's not obvious if an error has returned. Um, but for example, here we could say possibly some my broken list, otherwise zero, returns a zero rather than a nah. He also talks about using auto browser. Um, so the idea behind auto browser and I don't know if you guys work with browser when you're trying to debug functions, but I'll do it sometimes if I'm writing a, a function and I don't know why it's breaking, I'll put a browser call right above it. Usually it's that I've made kind of bad assumptions about what my variables are going to be as I start running things. Um, so the idea is that you're supposed to run it like this. Um, it doesn't work at all, of course, when you're in a learner. Um, I also found that it was not not great for me when I was trying to work it in an interactive session. So if I just do this, then I can source my sum file, which is here. Um, this works perfectly fine, as I expected the summing to work here. Um, this, it didn't really bring me into the browser session in the way I expected it to, as when you just throw like browser in your command like this. So I'm I'm not quite sure if I would use auto browser, but just FYI. Um, okay. So the next thing they discussed was using memeize. So memeization is a way to speed up a function by storing the results of slow function calls and returning the cached results. And memeize functions can run a lot faster, but they use a lot more memory. So it's a question of where you want to make the trade-offs when you, when you are writing your functions. So this is just kind of a showing of an example memeized function. Um, I'm going to use micro, micro benchmark to benchmark and plot the results of running these functions a bunch of time. So we define a function called slow function, um, which is going to take an input x. It will sleep for one second, and then it will times x times 10, and it'll return a random number. We can also simply just memeize the function by wrapping it in the memeize. Um, and that's right. So one thing to note is, and when you're doing micro benchmark, um, this is kind of how you set up micro benchmarks things. You assign it to something, you say, this is going to be the name, slow function one, fast function runtime previously seen, fast function one, um, fast function runtime new, fast function two. Um, and then you call times whatever number of times you want it to run. I told it to run 10 times. I think the default is 1,000. Uh, it's got a nice little auto plot function. So you can just then call autoplot, uh, make it slightly prettier. And what you can kind of immediately assess about this is that the memeized function is much, 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 much faster. So the slow function, which had to call this newly every time, um, its runtime is way up here, whereas the memeized functions are much faster. And you'll also notice there is this single dot here, which is much slower than the other calls. And this is the first time that you've called the memeize function. And after you call it the first time, it's just going to take the results of all the previously run times, which is why I've got function one, function two. So a really, I think, clear use case for memeization is if you wanted to do something like calculating Fibonacci series, 
um, everyone's kind of fun introduction to the concept of re recursive coding. So we can make a Fibonacci naive um, using the kind of simple idea and everyone knows what Fibonacci sequences. I don't need to spend time on explaining it. Okay, just making sure. <laughs> um, so if n is less than two, return one. Um, and then of course, call back the sum of the, the previous two. We can memize the function by simply wrapping it in the function operator memize. And we can appreciate when we do again, a micro benchmark 23, how much faster the memized version is than the naive function. I took a look at the way memization works and I think it works by creating environments, um, but I'm not like 100% sure. So yeah, I think it works by basically creating environments that store um, the results of additional calls but this is just my skimming of the way it works. But the important thing to remember is that whenever you memeize a function, you are gonna start storing a lot of things in memory. So all of the Fibonacci sequences, if I went up to 100, would then be stored inside of the memory. So it's a question, I think, when you're asking if you wanna memeize a function, if it's worth it for the memory versus the speed trade-off. All right. So I went through the exercises a little bit. Um, I, I don't know, how do you guys feel about going through these exercises? Someone, someone nod or give me a thumb or down. <laughs> I just, I didn't look at them too deeply so i don't know if there's something really interesting might be worth it i mean I, I didn't find the vectorize exercise very interesting um i thought this was kind of an interesting to one to read through so reading through the source code of possibly um i thought was an interesting kind of go through where basically what it's doing is it's it's relying on a base try catch try catch and then it's using the, the where is otherwise so it's returning otherwise or the function um so i thought that was kind of cool to note that this was basically just a wrapper around a base function of try catch and then the next question was the source code for safely oh, should i go back yeah th so that was basically that you uh run the function and if it hit like if it throws an error you um you already give a value that should be returned in that case right mm -hmm. yep so this is the try catch run the function um our error function e returns otherwise um and then if there's an interrupt otherwise it's just gonna run the function and return you the results here okay. um and then safely was bit more complicated, but it basically also works with the same idea that it's just a wrapper around try catch essentially. So it returns function, um, which is basically a wrapper of an additional functional operator of capture error, otherwise quiet. Um, and then it has this, this internal per function called capture error. Um, which is kind of, there's a term for it, a function that isn't exposed, but I'm blanking on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, right, so that's kind of these exercises. And then I thought the case study was kind of interesting. So I'll go through the case study. Um, and I tried to make my own case study but I just kind of ran out of time and it was gonna be really like in the weeds about how to download junction files. Um, <laughs> and I thought, no one's really that interested. So I'm gonna use his example. Um, okay, so the case study for why you might wanna use functional operators and what the advantage of them 
Um, let's say we had a list of URLs we were hoping to download and we wanted to store them somewhere. So we have our list of URLs, which is a named list here, and maybe it would go on and on and on and on. And we have a series of paths for like to download them to, which we can make with you know tempter names.html. So we learned in chapter nine that we can use the walk to function to download these files, um, going through each of these lists of for each item in URL, path, download file, and do it quietly. Um, but what if we wanted to download like 10,000 URLs? So we're gonna download 10,000 different HTMLs. This is probably gonna take a while and it's gonna be one of those functions where you're gonna let it run in your computer and then you're gonna go get a cup of tea and like putter around. Hopefully when you come back, it'll be done. Um, so we're gonna do two things to make this better. First, we're going to add in a little pause so that we don't overload the server and it doesn't think we're doing a, like a DDoS attack on it. And secondly, we're just gonna add a little dot so that we still know that the function is running. So it's fairly simple to do in a for loop, right? For I in seek long URLs, sleep for like what, 0.1 of a second. And then if the N, it, if we're on an iteration that's divisible by 10, print out a dot and then download files. But this makes it kind of hard to reuse. And every time we wanted to change something, like if we wanted to change the 10 here, we'd have to go in. Every time we'd want to change here, we'd have to go in. And it's also not very like, like portable because ideally when we're writing code, of course, we want to write functions that we can like grab and put into any other piece of code that we're writing at any other time. Um, so now we're going to try and redo this using the concept of function operators. So our first function operator is going to be creating a function operator called delay by. And this delay by is going to again take in a function and an amount. It's going to evaluate them both right away using force. And then it's simply going to return a function that will first call um, a sysleep by amount and then do the whatever function it is. We can then, of course, use our original walk to command just like this. So walk to URLs, path, delay by, download file, um, point one. Our second function operator is going to be a function operator that will make a dot every n. So we're not gonna be able to use the number of iterations we're on as we were able to the first time. So when we were doing the loop, we could just divide our, by our index, but what we're gonna, going to use this time is the idea of a stateful function that we learned in chapter nine or 10. Um, and we're gonna use the super assignment operator and rebind an index value, which is gonna be inside the enclosed environment. So again, we're gonna call our function dot every, it's gonna, take in a function and an n, it's gonna evaluate them right away. And then it's going to create a variable called i. And then inside of the function that it's going to return, this super, super assignment operator is going to change the value in its enclosing environment, which is gonna be i here. If i divisible by n, zero, cat, dot, and then run whatever function it is. So if we did walk 100 dot every run if 10, or if we did it every 20. Um, I had a little bit of a question about this behavior though, because while it makes, I think a lot of sense when we're using a function operator inside a functional, I thought it started to look a bit funny if I thought about just trying to use a function operator to create a function. So, I made this other little dot every, um, and the only difference with this dot every is now that it's gonna spit out exactly what it thinks n is, and then it's gonna spit out exactly what it thinks i is. So I can assign it like this. So count test should be a function. Um, and this is not what I thought was going to evaluate to. Um, so it does correctly, iterate the i, but this error bit kind of confused me. Because I would have thought that it would, it would inherit the n which was established when we assigned it. 
how did we do this when we were looking for things? It was like, was it a lobster thing or was it environment? If this was, well, it was, I think we're using print end last from last week. I think, is it print? Print, print end? Yeah. I is think. it in our line? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I think so. Print. And then print. And print. <laughs> uh, nice. Okay, so it thinks it's got an N. <laughs> uh, how do we get it N? But wait, it says the argument N is missing, not that N is missing. So you need to be N equals, you need to include, uh, the argument needs to, so what, so for okay. the function we've got every two, mm -hmm. what, are you putting in enough arguments? I guess. I mean, this should be our function run if, yeah, and then n two, and it thinks it can maybe, at least, yeah, at least count test it thinks it can find n. Um, let me see. Oops, oh, what did I forget to close? Oh. Sorry, I, I hate doing one line things because I get very confused with them. Okay. So it, it thinks it can find N. Yeah. Okay. okay, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna post this as a question in the Slack for the group in general, see if anybody can understand this behavior. Um, Cause this is not, this was super unexpected to me and clearly not just me alone. <laughs> um, okay. So then putting it all together at the end, um, we can do URLs, paths, download file, and then we use pipes to say dot every 10, delay by one, quiet true, which is cool because now we have these function operators dot every and delay by that we can use in any other case. So now let's say we're not downloading files with URLs, but we're querying a a RESTful API that's kind of slow and we're doing that a million times, we could then plop in dot every delay by. Um, and yeah, this that's kind of his case for function operators. Um, so these were two kind of interesting exercises I highlighted, one and two from this. Um, So they should do the same thing. If you do download file dot every 10 delay by 0.1 versus download file delay by 0.1 and dot every 10. The difference from my reading has to do with when you expect the dots to show up. Um, and then should we memeize file download? <laughs> From my well, reading of it, we do, yeah? Well, no, I was just gonna say, I guess not because, well, unless the, well, yeah, because if you're just downloading the file, right, you don't, in your next, um, 
next iteration you don't really need to access it unless i guess you want to make sure they're fully downloaded i don't know that's that might not make sense i'm with you um so i think it's probably not helpful to memeize it because the file Basically, you're storing everything in memory. And if you're downloading a massive HTML, you probably don't want to keep that information in memory at all times. Um, that was kind of my reasoning of why you wouldn't want to memeize it. Um, and it was a brief, short little chapter. So that's kind of the end. <laughs> Um, does... nice to have variety in length of chapter I think <laughs> yeah <laughs> I was really excited about this I was like ah oh, I'm gonna have to present and I looked at it and I was like oh this is so short <laughs> this is nothing <laughs> um so I, I guess like should... it's kind of so much of it is building on the previous chapters that like it's kind of like a, it's it's different enough that they obviously wanted to, to put it in there but if you've done the other chapters it's kind of like yeah okay cool yeah I mean it's not that much different an idea from a function factory like at all I think it's just now you're inputting also a function yeah yeah so has anybody volunteered for the next couple chapters Object oriented. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. I think, I mean, I'm happy to do if the next one's 12. Is, is it 12 or would it be? I guess we don't really do on... that. That's probably short. Uh, 12 looks relatively short. Yeah. I, it's just about base object orienting stuff. Um, yeah. If if twelve's the next one, I can do that one. If we don't have someone doing that. No, I don't think we have anyone. And then I think the next couple chapters are like quite dense. So I think S three, R six, S four are quite dense chapters. Mm -hmm. um, I remember the other group. May, did they say this is where they started slowing down? Was that right? Is anybody? Mm. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. What did that look like? Did they did they split up the chapters or did they like do them slower? As in, do take. I feel weeks like off? maybe they did like one chapter. Like they maybe either covered a chapter. Like they did S three had two weeks devoted to it. Mm -hmm. Would be I think what they did, but I might just be talking out of my butt. Like <laughs> I um, would be personally happy to go slowly through object oriented stuff because at least functional I like yeah. I mean I don't know I, I write functionally and I feel like a lot of people who do kind yeah. of biological stuff or data science and things are functionally oriented in general whereas object is a different kind of yeah. mindset yeah yeah I agree with that um because I think it'd be completely new to me so I yeah I'd mm -hmm. prefer to take the time um but I'm happy with what everyone else wants to do, really. Yeah, it sounds good. And we can ask people what they did last time and see if yeah. they have wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> wisdom. Cool. Wow. Yeah. This is great. We're still on time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, like, take a section, but probably not for a couple of weeks because um, I'm doing some other presenting and stuff. But um, but yeah, towards the end of November, I'm happy to do one. Just putting it out there. <laughs> All right. So I guess yeah, we can ask on the thing as well, because there's a few people who kind of probably have been around pretty regularly, but aren't around. Yeah. They who might be up for doing stuff as well. Yeah. Did we want to do a review of functional programming? I, I at least felt OK with it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'm also. It's quite short yeah. compared to the first section. 
Okay. Forward. <laughs> cool. Um, anything else we want to talk about? <laughs> There's an election going on. <laughs> no. Is the election day today or? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Can you vote when you're overseas? Or... Yeah, yeah. I voted back yeah. in um, end of October. I sent mine in. Oh, okay. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Election. We're going into <laughs> second lockdown. But don't yeah. worry, guys. We have a book club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Seeing people. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are you planning on staying up for like election results and stuff? Oh God, no, no! <laughs> I'm gonna go to bed. <laughs> I mean, I'm very like I'm not reading anything about it. There's nothing I can yeah. do anymore, so that's just kind of like feeding anxiety. So I don't know. This is this is partially why I was excited to give this book club today because I was like, ah, I will have something else that I need to stress mm -hmm. about. <laughs> Yeah, yeah and you're gonna hear about it soon enough, I guess, tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. 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 Cool. Okay, in that case, I might go have dinner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do some dishes. <laughs> oh, team. <laughs> Thanks yeah. so much. That was great. Thanks, guys. Yeah, See that you was next great. week. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.